All right, guys, so I am going to be doing your BPH male reproductive review. First off, I apologize for like all the background noise. <laughs> I told you guys I was moving and literally we moved into this apartment yesterday and found that the AC is broken. So it's literally like 87 in here. I'm not even kidding, but yeah, so those are gonna be in the background, I hate to tell you, but I'm gonna try to talk loud so that way you guys can hear me. Luckily, this one shouldn't be as long because it's like just BPH. Um, and I feel like we did not even do prostate cancer. I saw someone talking about Yeah. All right, well, anyway, so let's get into it. Okay, so BPH is an enlargement of the prostate gland, and so that results in an increased number of uh, epithelial cells and connective tissues in the prostate. And so basically your prostate just gets bigger. It's a really gradual process. It's not something that's just gonna like happen overnight. Um, and so your symptoms come because the way that the male anatomy is set up is if your prostate is enlarged, it's going to compress the urethra. And so that's why you develop like urinary symptoms. Um, usually it's in men over 50. And I want to say this is actually like, it's expected that as you get older, um, like your prostate is going to get bigger, but like BPH is not always going to happen, if that makes sense. Um, it's usually in men over 50 and it's the most common urologic problem in adults, male adults. Um, as far as like etiology and patho, it's not really understood like a lot of things that we've talked about, but they say that it might be because of some hormonal changes with the aging process. So there's, um, DTH, I cannot pronounce that, dihydroxytestosterone, okay, yeah, I can, dihydroxytestosterone, DTH, so if there's like an excess production of that in the prostate cells, um, some scientists think that that can stimulate overgrowth of the prostate tissue, and so that's why it becomes enlarged. Um, another thing that they've like proposed might be a cause is because as men age, your testosterone levels and the blood decrease while your estrogen levels increase. And so that might cause overgrowth as well. Um, but one thing I have highlighted here that I think is really important to remember, and this involves prostate cancer and BPH, so very well could be tested over. And I wanna say we had a question relating to this is that Usually the inner part of the prostate is affected with BPH, whereas with prostate cancer, it's the outer part. And so that's really important when determining like treatments and stuff, because you have to know like what is actually causing the symptoms. Like I said, risk factors, men over 50, um, smoking as always, ED, positive family history. Um, I would say aging is probably the biggest one because that's when it tends to happen is just like men as they get older. Um, so as far as clinical manifestations, I have this highlighted, I would definitely know this, nocturia is often the first symptom noticed and it can lead to acute urinary retention. So nocturia is remember at night. Um, and so like, if you're having to go to the bathroom all the time at night, then like that can cause urinary retention. Um, and so then that's gonna be a sudden painful inability to urinate. Other things are gonna be um, like frequency and urgency, dysuria, so painful urination, bladder pain, incontinence. And so those are all considered irritative and ir irritative symptoms. So those are all symptoms that patients complain about um, and it's associated with inflammation or infection. Obstructive symptoms, on the other hand, are symptoms that are like directly related to um, that like prostate size and how it's blocking the urethra or pressing on the urethra. Um, so that could be like a decreased force and stream, 
decreased stream size, difficulty like starting urination, intermittency, so like you start to urinate and then you stop, uh, dribbling, and all of these symptoms put you at risk for a UTI. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much symptoms. Like I said, I would know nocturia is often the first one that you notice and that that can lead to um, urinary retention. So as far as diagnostic studies go, there's actually quite a few that we can look at um, to see if prostate cancer, or not prostate cancer, if BPH is likely. Um, obviously, you're going to do a history and physical. You're also going to try to rule out conditions. So you might do a urinalysis to look for like white blood cells, bacteria, um, microhematuria, whereas like those could indicate that there's an infection, inflammation, like something else going on. There's also um, uh, da, 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 da. there's also this um, seven question like seven questionnaire that we can do. It's called the um, American Urological Association Symptom Index. And so, what you need to know with this is it's seven questions, and the higher the score, the greater the symptom severity. So, this is not diagnostic. Important to know not a diagnostic tool but it's useful to determine like if a patient has symptoms and if they do like how severe those symptoms are um, yeah so then one thing that you can do is a prostate biopsy and so this is usually done if prostate cancer is suspected however like Obviously, if someone's having all these symptoms, you might need to rule out prostate cancer. So um, that's important to know. So just understand that prostate biopsy, you usually do this for prostate cancer suspicion, and you want to monitor for infection, and there's 12 possible sites that you can biopsy on the prostate. Most of the time, the needles are inserted through the rectum, but like there's a lot of different sites. Another thing relating to prostate cancer and BPH is your PSA level. So PSA level is usually used to rule out prostate cancer. Um, there's a lack of consistency in guidelines, but like they vary over time as well. But generally, if, if you have somebody that gets their PSA level taken, um, which PSA is a protein that's produced by normal and malignant cells of the prostate. So if someone gets this test and it's above four, then you would recommend the prostate biopsy. But um, it, like I said, it's inconsistent. And I remember Dr. Schneider telling us about how like there have been several patients who they get their PSA levels taken and it's under four, which generally means that you're okay and they still end up having prostate cancer. So. For the exam, I would know that if it's above four, you recommend that prostate biopsy, which we just talked about, 12 possible sites, um, do it if you suspect cancer, and that you monitor for infection. Um, there's also a lot of other things that can increase it. So you could have like biopsies and surgeries that could increase your PSA level. Drugs can, um, I believe exercise can as well. Um, yeah, so like activities like biking, sex, those can also raise your PSA levels. And so that's why like it's pretty inconsistent. Um, one thing is that, and I remember we had this question or like something relating to it. So if you like get someone's PSA level and it's really high, but they don't have any symptoms of prostate cancer or BPH, then you're going to redraw the lab. If it's still high after that, then you're going to continue to redraw with regular draws and you might do a biopsy. Another thing that I have highlighted that's really important to know is that you always, 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 always want to draw your PSA level before you do a rectal exam because, um, like I said, activities can raise your, B your PSA level. So, um, like if you do a rectal exam first, then that could be enough to raise your PSA level. So that is PSA. Um, 
like I said, it, it looks at prostate cancer. So if you have somebody that is showing symptoms of BPH, you're going to want to rule out prostate cancer, which is why you get this drawn. And if it's above four, you're going to have them get a prostate biopsy. If it's high, um, but they don't have any symptoms, then you're going to redraw it. And if it's still high, then you're just going to continue to monitor them. And you want to do a PSA level before you get a rectal exam, do any activities like biking, sex, other exercise. Moving on to that rectal exam. So digital rectal exam basically can be done to estimate the size, symmetry, and consistency of the prostate. So this is very important, highlight this. Um, so the prostate will be firm, smooth, and symmetrically enlarged if it's BPH. Because, and that makes sense, because BPH is just like your prostate getting bigger over time. So theoretically, it should it should get larger at the same like rate. Whereas um, if it's prostate cancer, then it's probably just like a section of it that's out of whack. So if it's prostate cancer, it's asymmetrically enlarged. Nodules are cancer risk and boggy is an infection risk. So normal will be firm. I'm gonna say that one more time because that's really important to know. So the prostate will be firm symmetrically enlarged and smooth if it's BPH. If it's prostate cancer, it's going to be asymmetrically enlarged. Nodules, like the presence of nodules, mean there's a cancer risk, and if the prostate is boggy, then that's an infection risk. And once again, I have highlighted you get your PSA done before your digital rectal exam. Other little diagnostic tests that we might do if someone's presenting with BPH symptoms are going to be look at your kidney labs just to rule out like a kidney disorder and then you're going to do a neuro exam to rule out like neurogenic bladder. I also have written down some like American Cancer Society recommendations on screening for um, prostate exams and such. I don't remember this being on the exam, but like I do think it's important and like Dr. Schneider loves to test over like interventions and screenings. So I think it's really important that we discuss this really quickly. Um, so the recommendation according to the American Car Cancer Society is that men that are 50 and who are at average risk are expected to live at least 50 or at least 10 years. Um, is when you should get your screening. If you're 45 is when you should get your screening, is at 50. So then if you're at a higher risk for developing prostate cancer, so like you're African American, a man with like a history of a first degree relative, um, something like that, then you should do it at age 45. And if you're f like a really high risk, then you should do it at 40. And then if no prostate cancer is found after a screening, the time between future screenings depends on the result of the PSA, which we already talked about. Um, so like for instance, if you have a PSA less than two and a half, you might only need to be retested every two years, while if it's above two and a half, you're probably gonna get annual testing. And that is just like, um, so like with colonoscopies, I feel like they have very similar like criteria about how like it depends on what they find for when you're going to get um, like rescreened. Moving into therapy for B BPH, therapy and treatment, the goals are obviously to restore bladder drainage, relieve symptoms, and you want to treat complications and prevent them because obviously like having a blockage can cause like a UTI, um, urosepsis, pilo, renal failure, stones, all of that, and we don't want that. So treatment overall is going to be based on the symptoms and if you have presence of complications. So like conservative therapy would be we're just going to like monitor you. So like you might have um, no symptoms. Maybe you have mild symptoms based off of that screening tool. Um, and so maybe like we can encourage you to make some lifestyle ch decisions like exercise more um, and your symptoms can disappear. But generally speaking, that's like the conservative therapy, and a lot of times we're going to have to do more than that. 
Another thing to keep in mind with treatment that I have highlighted is that treatment is generally not based on the size of the prostate. It's based on the symptoms and the complications if they're present. So remember that. As for drug therapy, so we use 5-beta reductase inhibitors and alpha adrenergic receptor blockers. Um, for BPH, you can use both, and that actually increases effectiveness, but um, you, you'll see patients that have just one. So finasteride or proscar, probably saying that wrong, is one that you can use. Important things to know about this is you're at risk for decreased libido, and women should not use, or not use, but like not be around or like in contact with this drug because it's at risk for fertili infertility. Um, you also have to take this consistently to maintain therapeutic levels um, because like your serum PSA can actually decrease by like 50% if you take this consistently. Um, 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 uh, but the goal with this med is to shrink the prostate tissue itself. And this differs from other meds because other meds are going to be focusing more on symptoms, whereas this one is actually focusing on shrinking the prostate. Um, but it can take like three to six months to be effective. So that's something that you want to like teach your patients. So like I said, biggest things with finasteride or Proscar is that um, you're at risk for decreased libido and decreased volume of ejaculation and ED. Those are like three of the biggest potential side effects. And then women or anybody of reproductive age should not come into contact with this med. And if you do, you should like be wearing gloves, like you need to wear the appropriate PPE. And the goal is to shrink the prostate, but it can take three to six months to be effective. Um, other medicine, medication, so Tamulosin or Flomax, that's a big one that you'll see in the hospital doxazosin or kadura i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right and then psilidosin or rapaflo those are all alpha blockers and the way that you can remember that is those all have the ending sin s-i-n so if you see one that has the ending sin then you should know that it's an alpha blocker and the goal for those medications is it's relaxing smooth muscle of the prostate to produce urine flow so like we talked about with finasteride um that one is actually working to shrink the prostate, whereas these alpha blockers like Flomax, they're just working to re relax the prostate and just like get urine flowing. Um, so it's more for like the symptoms of BPH. You can also use this for hypertension. So biggest risk factor for this, like side effect wise, is that you might have orthostatic hypertension or hypotension and falls as a potential. Um, Flomax is also sometimes used with kidney stone patients, but usually these take two to three weeks to be effective. And like I said, they don't treat the hyperplasia, they treat the symptoms. So just know that your alpha blockers are your meds that end in sin and they relax the smooth muscle to promote urine flow. They can also be used for hypertension. So you have a risk of orthostatic hypotension and falls. So like you would want to educate your patients to be like slow getting up, you know, maybe not bend over. And it can take two to three weeks for these. Um, and they focus on symptoms rather than like shrinking the prostate. Other drugs are, um, so, so Viagra and then Tadalafil or Cialis. So these are drugs that can be used for ED, but you can also use them for BPH. You can use herbal therapy to manage lower UT UTI symptoms. So like saw palmetto has been seen like to be effective. Um, however, you like this doesn't like research based. So you got to be careful with that. And uh, nausea and vomiting is a really common side effect. I think we had a question on that. Um, so that's with saw palmetto and you don't want to use that with hypertensive patients. And then there's like some other drugs, but they like don't have as much success. So going back really quickly to finasteride, I also have duasteride, which is Avidart. That one is just another 5-beta reductase inhibitor. So any 5-beta reductase inhibitor is going to end with IDE, so IDE, and those are the ones that are going to try to shrink the prostate. Um, 
rather than to like just relieve symptoms. So that's important. And then your alpha um, blockers are the ones that end in sin. So now moving on. So that is like all of the medications for BPH. The other aspect of this that was really big on this exam is the surgical therapy, um, which we do if like nothing is working and symptoms are just like out of control. And so it's called a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate. And so that's basically where the surgeon goes in and cuts away the obstructive tissue. Um, and so like you put a catheter in as well to keep the urine just like continuously flowing. So this is a very invasive procedure. And so that's why like we don't do this as first line. Really the only time that we do this is if like decrease in urine flow is sufficient enough to cause discomfort. We have persistent residual urine. Uh, we have urinary retention, hydronephrosis, which is swelling and drainage damage, sorry, not drainage, to one or both kidneys due to obstruction and retention. So this isn't a primary disease, it's a secondary disease, but it can cause, or not cause, it can come from BPH. So really, if we have like any of those criteria, maybe a few more, then that's when we're going to look at maybe doing TERP. Um, other things really quickly though, like that you could do for treatment if you don't want to do a TERP is you can try um, straight cathing somebody, but just remember like you don't want to do that long term because of the infection risk. So going back to TERP, it has an 80 to 90% success rate um, and low complications, but like I said, very invasive, so we don't want to do this first line. Usually they're going to have spinal or general anesthesia, and there is a hospital stay required. Um, so, as far as like nursing interventions go for pre, so like pre-op before a TERP, you want to like treat any infections they have. So if they have a UTI, like give them the right antibiotics. They have to stop anticoagulants. Highlight that. You want to make sure you're like communicating with them, providing them an opportunity to like vent any emotions they have in form of possible complications. Um, that sort of thing. And then your post-op, so your nursing interventions for post-op, you want to make sure you tell them they cannot resume sexual activity for three to six weeks. Usually, e like, your erection won't be affected, but, you know, patients want to make sure that that uh, isn't affected. And usually you'll have that back after a few weeks. You want to make sure they're drinking plenty of fluids, uh, teach them how to do Kegel exercises, stool softeners to prevent straining, manage incontinence, and observe for UTIs. Analgesics and decreased activity is also usually the case for 24 hours. And you want to monitor for obviously like DVTs, skin breakdown, all of that fun stuff that we talk about with literally any hospital stay. Um, obviously the goals are to prevent complications and restore that urinary um, function and help the patients to have satisfactory sexual expression. Also post-op, you want to assess for complications. So that's going to be like hemorrhage and clots. That's the biggest one. And then also like bladder spasms. As for home care with patients who have a TERP, so this is like the education portion. Um, and this is like what you want to teach them before they go home. You want to prevent constipation and straining with a high fiber diet and stool softeners because if they're like straining, that increase in intra-abdominal pressure can actually lead to bleeding at the surgical site, and so we don't want to do that. You want to avoid heavy lifting, so no more than 10 pounds or four and a half kilos. You want to teach them about catheter care, managing incontinence, fluids, Kegels, UTI symptoms, infection symptoms. They shouldn't drive or have sex um, unless like ordered by their doctor for like the time frame. Like I said, it's usually three to six weeks um, until they can resume sexual activity. And then also like sexual counseling might be a thing for them if ED ends up being a thing. And then they should also avoid bladder irritants. I have this highlighted so I would remember. 
Um, so things like alcohol, coffee, tea, acidic foods, spicy foods, and chocolate, don't want to give them those. And then they also also so should continue getting yearly um, digital rectal exams. Um, so that is like your pre-post, whatever you want to call it. Another thing though is like the nurse's role in the TERT procedure and just like overall. So the nurse's role is to manage and keep a close eye on the continuous bladder irrigation. So basically what happens with this procedure is your bladder is irrigated for the first 24 hours after to prevent mucus and blood clots. And so as a nurse, our role is to keep a close eye on that, like, that system. And so your CBI or your continuous bladder irrigation is a big bag of sterile antibacterial isotonic irrigation solute. That is a mouthful and it's hung and then the irrigation goes into the bladder it like lyses all the clots and it pulls any blood out into the drainage bag and so um, the goal is to titrate the fluids you want to run light pink to clear within 24 hours if it turns if the fluid is red then you want to speed it up and if it's clear then you want to slow down if um, you start to see clots then you can do manual irrigation like if you stop seeing them so that's really important to remember is that you want to titrate the fluids so they run light pink to clear within 24 hours. If they're like bright red, then you want to speed up, clear, slow down. And then if you stop seeing clots, then you want to do manual irrigation. So um, basically we do this procedure, like I said, to stop um, clot prevention or to keep clot prevention. Um, you want to make sure that you keep track of the bag num bags so you can number them and monitor INO. Don't overflow them and increased bladder distension can cause pain and bleeding. So like that's why we don't overflow them. They also might have bladder spasms with this. So like you want to make sure that you're giving them antispasmodics if needed. Um, so yeah, that is all I have with the TERP procedure. There's another procedure I have, the Eurolift. I don't remember anything about this, but basically you go into the urethra with a Eurolift device and you place this device and it like holds the prostate tissue like out of the way so it can help you to have uh, proper urinary flow, but I don't remember anything about that. Okay, so now, so that is all I have for like BPH and prostate cancer. Like I literally don't have anything else about prostate cancer um, other than that. I'm gonna look really quickly at your guys' PowerPoint because I wanna make sure that, cause like I have some stuff on other conditions and I'm probably gonna talk about it anyway just so you guys have it in case you were to get a question on it. Um, but like if it's not on your PowerPoint, then I'm not going to talk about it like too much. Yeah, it doesn't look like you guys have it talked about. Um, oh, wow, you guys did a lot with prostate cancer. So, hold on, I'm gonna look and see, like, cancer is your next unit, and I feel like we maybe talked about it there, so I'm gonna see if I have any notes on that, because I would hate to just be like, yeah, I don't have anything, and like, actually have notes. Okay, yeah, I do not have anything on prostate cancer, so I don't know why we didn't talk about it, but you guys did. I have really quickly something on prostatitis, which is just like inflammation. Um, it's just like anything that um, affects the prostate. Like, I don't know. It's, you guys know, like that's that root itis just means inflammation. Um, so this is, once again, you can have those urinary symptoms, tender with a DRE, positive urine culture, cloudy discharge, smell that sort of thing, just anything for infection. And then if it's bacterial, you're gonna do antibiotics. And if it's um, 
like bad enough, you're gonna maybe need to put a calf in. But that is literally the only other thing that I have on um, on prostate. I do have a couple things really quickly on just like other male reproductive disorders. I don't know if you guys did them or not, but I'm gonna just like say a couple things that I remember we were tested over. And I think that's like two things. So one thing I remember we were tested over is a vasectomy. So you guys all probably know a vasectomy is um, a procedure that causes sterility of men. It's very quick, usually outpatient, like 15 to 30 minutes under local anesthesia. And as a nurse, you want to monitor for hematoma and swelling. Patients need to have, this is what we had a question on on the exam. It was about the education after a patient has a vasectomy. So a patient that has this procedure needs to have 10 ejaculations or they need to wait six weeks to evacuate sperm with contraception after a procedure. So they need to have 10 ejaculations or it needs to take six weeks with contraception after the procedure to like get all the sperm out of your system. Um, I just remember we had a question on that. I also remember we had a question on testicular cancer and like self exams. So basically testicular cancer is pretty like it's not super common, but the incidence is definitely increasing and it's said to affect like younger men usually. Um, but like if you find it early enough, you can treat it really, really quickly and like really well. The biggest way to prevent testicular cancer is a self exam. And so you want to take the self exam or do the self exam after a warm shower or like in a warm shower. Um, because like that's when your scrotum is relaxed. And so you can like best look and feel for any nodules or masses. One thing I want to stress is it's very, it's not uncommon for like men to have one, um, like one larger than the other or for their testicles to hang low. So like, I just remember the question that we had on the exam. It was like, which of the following is like the patient education you should provide for a patient about testicular cancer. And there was an option and it said you should call 911 if you have one testicle bigger than the other and i remember so much my cohort put that answer but that wasn't right because like like i said there's a lot of reasons why one could be enlarged and to be honest like a lot of men have that and it's just normal and so the answer was about how the best time to do a testicular self-exam is after a warm shower um, like I said, they can be enlarged from other reasons like cancer, but they can also be enlarged due to um, dilated veins, so vera, variocele or fluid, so that's hydrocele. Um, another thing I have that is really important is testicular torsion. So this is a medical emergency, and this is basically twisting of the spermatic cord that supplies blood to the testes and the epididymis. I can never say this word, epididymitis, I don't know. I've never been able to say that word ever since AMP. Um, this is very common under the age of 20, but it's a medical emergency because of the lack of blood flow. And so you need to have manual fixing or surgical correction within six hours of the ischemia of the issue, or ischemia can result and cause necrotic testicles. Um, so that is very, very important, is that if you have somebody that has testicular torsion or you suspect has testicular torsion, then they need to get that fixed within six hours or they could have necrotic uh, testicular tissue. Um, number one sign and symptom is obviously pain, swelling. It's a very painful thing, but they also can have an absent cremaster reflex, which is where you like stroke the thigh and normally the testicles will like pull up. ED, I don't really have anything on. That's just irritability to maintain erection. Um, I have, like, with those medications, you usually take them 30 to 60 minutes before intended sex, and you should monitor for hypotension. If you're having chest pain and MI, um, or you're, like, about to give nitroglycerin, you need to ask about ED meds, because if you, if you have a patient that took an ED med and you give them nitro, like, it can bottom them out talked about vasectomy, talked about torsion, talked about testicular cancer. 
Um, yeah, that's about it. Like I said, I know you guys, I don't think, talked about that. I didn't see it anywhere, but I figured I would just, like, say something just in case. I, I'm sorry I don't have anything on prostate cancer. Um, I'm sure registered nurse RN might have something on that. And then if I do find that I have stuff on it, I'll let you guys know. But, like, I don't have anything other than, like, the PSA levels and such and, like, the recommended screenings and whatnot. I don't, like, I have that that I already talked about. But, like, even on the HIV and cancer um, folder that I have, like, I don't have, like, anything. So, I'm checking one more place to see. The only thing I have on my like cancer notes and such about the prostate about prostate cancer is that you use the Gleason scoring system. So I don't even know if you guys talked about that, but it's based on biopsy samples from the prostate. And so like um, each pattern is given. So you take a primary and a secondary pattern of tissue with the biopsy, and then each pattern is given a grade from one to five. And so one is just like normal prostate tissue, five is the most abnormal, and so then they're added to give a Gleason score. So like if you have a Gleason score of X, that means it couldn't be determined. Two to six is they're well differentiated, seven is it's moderately differentiated, and eight to 10 is poorly differentiated or undifferentiated, and that is obviously the worst. So, yeah, that is all I have on BPH, TERP, prostate, all that fun stuff. Um, as always, reach out to me if you guys have questions and comment your email. I don't have my Wi-Fi set up yet in this apartment, so, like, if I'm a little slow responding to you guys, that's why. Although, being honest, I'm probably not going to be staying here tonight because it's miserable. Um, but like, feel free to reach out to me between now and the test and I can help you guys in whatever way you want. Um, if there's a concept that's just like not making sense, I can definitely provide my two cents and try and help you guys out. But other than that, if you guys have any questions, let me know. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. Happy studying. You're going to do great. You guys are good. You prepared for this and you know it. So let me know if I can do anything for you guys. See ya.